It is the world's fastest growing faith. One of every four people on earth finds spiritual peace in the words of the Quran. Nearly 1400 years ago, the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad with revelations that he was to deliver to all of mankind. He spent the rest of his life communicating God's message and setting an example for how each human being should live. Today, many Americans associate Islam with images of violence and hatred. But such scenes are the work of a few suicidal fanatics. Their actions directly contradict the teachings of Muhammad and cloud the memory of a man who long ago brought a new message of hope and serenity. It is not possible to conclude that the Prophet is a man of hate. The Prophet of Islam is without doubt the most misunderstood major aspect of the Islamic religion. Who was this man who founded Islam and brought spiritual comfort to so many? Muhammad is often thought to be worshipped as Jesus uh, was is worshipped by Christians. Um, this is absolutely and categorically not the case. He was an ordinary human being with the same emotions, the same fears, the same insecurities that we live with. Today, Muhammad's words of tolerance and peace offer many the same guidance as they have for centuries. God's messenger, the prophet Muhammad. Out of respect for the beliefs and practices of Muslims, no image of the prophet Muhammad or his immediate family will be shown in this biography. Five times each day, over a billion and a half people turn toward the ancient city of Mecca and offer their prayers to Allah. From New York to Indonesia, from Nigeria to the steppes of Central Asia, Muslims repeat the words first learned 1400 years ago from the lips of a humble merchant and gentle teacher named Muhammad. There was a time when he was very poor and he had only one blanket and he needed it, but there was a cat sleeping on the blanket. So he tore that part out, which was under the cat, because he did not want to disturb the cat. And he took the rest of the blanket and went away. The life of Muhammad ibn Abdullah began in 570 of the Common Era. He was born in Mecca, a thriving trading community in the land that is today Saudi Arabia. No one could have known that the life of this child would become the foundation of a religion that would one day change history. At the time of Muhammad's birth, Arabia was a harsh, barren land, broken only by the occasional oasis. The Arabs who lived in this demanding world migrated from site to site, struggling to live off their flocks in the harsh desert. To survive in such a place, Arabs depended on the support of their tribe, the tribe protected them from harm, not only from the desert, but also from the endless raids and vendettas launched by other tribes. Social life in pre-Islamic Arabia was grim, uh, and Muhammad was born into a time of violence, turmoil, and despair, not unlike our own. The basic structure of social organization was the tribe. But the desert nomads also depended on other Arabs who had gradually built small cities where they engaged in commerce. The most prosperous of these cities was Mecca, home to the young Muhammad. Muhammad was a member of a tribe called the Quraysh who had left the nomadic life and become prosperous as caravan traders. Muhammad had been raised an orphan. By the time he was eight, he was under the care of an uncle who was head of one clan of the Quraysh tribe. As the primary tribe of Mecca, the Quraysh were also the keepers of the Arabs' holiest religious shrine, the Kaaba. Although a deity known as Allah was recognized, many other gods and goddesses were also worshipped at the ancient Kaaba. Arabs prayed to over 300 idols that stood in and around the sacred cube-shaped structure. It had a very important social and political consequence because uh, it was a holy place and all violence was forbidden in a 30-mile radius around the Kaaba. Trading had brought wealth to Mecca. 
But jealousy and constant feuds were breaking down the old tribal system. The rich were ignoring the poor. Some felt that the old Arab religion needed change. Jews and Christians had had their prophets of reform. Just as Moses and Jesus had provided inspiration and renewal, many in Mecca now longed for a new spiritual revitalization. Muhammad had become a caravan manager in his native city, leading trading trips as far away as the land that is today Syria. But he was also aware that the old values of charity and community were breaking down in Mecca. Muhammad was deeply respectful of the religion of his ancestors. He was a frequent visitor to the Kaaba and attempted to lead a life of fairness and respect for all. We don't have lots and lots of information about the prophet Muhammad uh, before he was called to be a prophet, but that information which the tradition has passed down indicates somebody who was, on the one hand, very good at what he did, a caravan manager. His nickname, among, among other things, was Al-Amin, the trustworthy person. He was uh, very soon known as the righteous one because he was known for being a fair kind of man, a man who was concerned with social issues. As well as somebody who was uh, efficient, he was seen as somebody who had strong leadership qualities. He was good looking, uh, he had a piercing fate, eyes that seemed to go into people's souls, a smile, he sometimes looked sad, uh, but, and, and a very sort of um, distinctive way of walking. In the year 595, Muhammad was hired by a wealthy woman of Mecca named Khadija to organize and guide a caravan for her. He accepted and returned with a handsome prophet. The trip would begin a new life for Muhammad and Khadija. He was an international business executive whose boss was a woman. And uh, he was obviously very eligible and she proposed to him directly. Khadija, in many ways, is an interesting uh, historical figure. Uh, she's a self-made woman who decided to propose to uh, Muhammad, who was uh, not a prophet at that time. He was, reports say, 15 years her junior. Um, they apparently had a very loving relationship. Muhammad and Khadija had five daughters. Muhammad was an adoring father and throughout his life displayed affection for all children. Although the clan headed by his uncle had little prestige among the Quraysh, Muhammad's reputation in Mecca continued to grow. He was known for his kindness to slaves, his charity to the poor, and his fairness in dealing with all. Each year during Ramadan, the ninth month of the lunar year, Muhammad sought out the mountains surrounding Mecca as a place where he could refresh himself in solitude and prayer. In the year 610, at the age of 40, the humble business manager and family man took himself on one of these retreats to a mountain cave. Day and night, Muhammad remained in the cave to fast and pray. One night, as flames danced on the darkened cave walls, Muhammad's life changed forever. Suddenly, an angel in the form of a man appeared and commanded him proclaim. Muhammad was terrified and confused and said he had nothing to proclaim. The angel clasped Muhammad in a suffocating embrace. Harder and harder, he was squeezed until it seemed the last breath of life would be wrung from his body. Proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created, created man from a clot of blood. Proclaim, and thy Lord is most bountiful. Muhammad was terrified and ran from the cave. He was sure something awful was happening to him. But as he scrambled over the mountainside, the angel returned and spoke again. O Muhammad, thou art the messenger of God, and I am Gabriel. He was terrified, 
I think any of us would be if we suddenly uh, started receiving voices and seeing visions of angels. The traditions about the life of the prophet present him as coming back from this experience profoundly shaken. Petrified with fear from a mystical experience he did not comprehend, Muhammad rushed to Khadija. And she held him in her arms and said, you know, my dear, you know, this, these things are from God. Uh, and she, it was she who convinced him that these were not delusions. But in his fear, Muhammad did not fully understand the frightening events that had happened to him. He could not know that the angel Gabriel would return again and again to deliver the words of God, and that the words that would eventually pour from Muhammad's lips would forever alter the future of his people and the world. In the year 610, a 40-year-old Arab businessman with a wife and a family had been suddenly visited by an angel and commanded to become God's messenger. Slowly, Muhammad ibn Abdullah began to accept that God wished him to speak to his people as Moses and Christ had carried God's word in another time. Several revelations followed the first, but Muhammad was confused and struggled to understand precisely what message God wanted him to carry. Then, suddenly, the revelations stopped. Muhammad waited in darkness. He thought perhaps God had abandoned him. Perhaps he hadn't been worthy. He did not sh know whether that was the end of the communication with God and what was he supposed to do based on that limited communication. What had he done to offend heaven and the angel who had spoken to him? How could he be a messenger if he had no message? But as he sunk to the depths of despair, the silence was broken by another revelation. By the morning brightness and by the stillness of the night, thy Lord hath not forsaken thee, nor is he displeased with thee. What is to follow is better than what has preceded, and soon thou will be granted that which will please thee. It was now clear to Muhammad that he had not misunderstood the first revelations. He had indeed been called to tell the world there must be no other gods but the one God, Allah. As more revelations came, the words were etched into Muhammad's memory. As he recited them, they were written down and became the Quran, God's holy book. At first, only Khadija and a few close friends and family accepted the Quran. But little by little, Muhammad started to speak out, and Arabs and other clans of the Quraysh began to embrace the message. The words of the Quran clearly had great impact, for his listeners responded to the words not as religious instructions, but as poetry. Before the rise of Islam, the Arabs did not have great architecture, they did not have great art of textile or practically no calligraphy, but that very great poetry, oral poetry, that was the supreme art. And so what had developed at that time was a culture in which poetry played the role uh, perhaps of, of television programs, uh, uh, maybe soap operas, uh, even more in our moder modern culture. In towns and cities, or in simple Bedouin camps in the desert, those Arabs who could perform poetry and music had enormous status. Now, as Muhammad chanted the verses of the Quran, the words became music as he touched a deeply spiritual nerve in his listeners. Many stepped forward to embrace Islam and its message, but for Muhammad, they were not accepting something new, simply returning to an old religion. In many ways, the prophet was calling people back to the one true faith, to the faith of Abraham, and back to the one true God, not to a new God, but it, it was to the one true God whose revelation had, had gone to Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. And therefore, Muhammad, in every sense of the term, is a reformer. 
So far, Mohammed had avoided any mention of the idols that stood in and around the Kaaba. Now he announced that the Quraysh would have to stop worshipping all other gods. He demanded a radical new expression of faith. The words began. He is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the eternal, absolute. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. And there is none like unto him. There could be no greater loyalty than to God, not to any tribal deity, not to some traditional idol, not even to the tribe. This mild-mannered merchant was now demanding Arabs forsake the gods of their ancestors. Their real identity was rooted in their uh, family and clan and kin connections because it was that that gave them a position in the world. When Muhammad comes with a new uh, set of religious ideas or is trying to renew a set of religious ideas focused on monotheism, uh, people whose ancestors had been pagans said, what are our, what's happened to our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers? And Muhammad had to say, well, they're burning in hell because they didn't believe in one god. This new commandment was to be called Islam, meaning an act of surrender to God's will. For some, initially, they could simply dismiss the prophet since this was so out of whack with the society as, as somebody who was uh, uh, out of his mind, as somebody who was deluded. But as he began to develop this seminal community and as the prophet, given his conviction, was so uh, public in preaching this message, then, then more and more of this was taken by the Quraysh establishment as a direct threat. The new message of Islam now ripped the fabric of the Quraysh community. Soon, like Jesus before him, Muhammad's ministry was turning father against son, family against family. The establishment certainly feared uh, that a man who claimed to be receiving special messages from Allah, the high god of the Arabian pantheon, uh, would soon demand greater political powers. The most powerful Quraysh leaders turned on Muhammad and his followers. Muslims were tortured. Some were whipped, others staked for days in the fierce Arabian sun. Muhammad himself endured the fury of his neighbors who hurled dirt and insults at him in the streets. For two years, Quraysh leaders placed a ban on intermarriage and trade with any followers of Islam. No one was allowed to sell them food. The agony of this period increased when Khadija died in 619. When his uncle died not long after, he lost his protector, and it became clear that Muhammad's life was in real danger. His wife is dead, his uncle is dead. Uh, although he has followers, many of them are being tortured, imprisoned, persecuted. He is powerless to help many of those that, that he loves, and many of those that have, have believed in him. It is in this devastating time, as Muhammad came to the end of his resources, that he had his greatest mystical experience. On a night in 620, Muhammad was again awakened by the angel Gabriel. The angel presented him with a winged horse-like creature that flew the prophet through the night sky to Jerusalem. There he was greeted by Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and all the other prophets. At last, the creature took him higher and higher beyond earthly space and time. Muhammad departed his physical body, and his spirit at last stood at the summit of the universe. His celestial journey to Jerusalem suggested to Muhammad that he was entering into a new phase of his service to God and Islam. He now also understood that he could no longer remain in Mecca. Over 200 miles to the north of ancient Mecca lay the fertile oasis of Yathrib. It was a lush island of green amidst harsh volcanic mountains and untillable desert soil. Its sweet water and abundant crops of grain and dates made for a comfortable life. But Yathrib was troubled. The tribes who lived in this beautiful place were locked in a deadly state of rivalry. Crammed together in this small oasis, the tribes were caught up in a continuing pattern of warfare and violence. Something was needed to break the pattern. 
In the same year he had made his mystical night flight to Jerusalem, Muhammad met six pilgrims from Yathrib, making the annual pilgrimage, or Hajj, to the Kaaba in Mecca. He told the men of his mission and recited the verses from the Quran. The men were immediately moved by Muhammad's message, but they also saw in the Prophet someone who could mediate the stalemate of violence in Yathrib. They made him an offer. The citizens of Yathrib would submit to Allah. In exchange, Muhammad would become their leader. Muhammad was invited to a community that was in many ways divided and in disarray. And they basically invited him saying that they, they needed a strong leader to come in and to organize and lead that community. Muhammad saw a chance to expand Islam in Yathrib. He also saw a haven that would protect him and his followers from persecution. He urged all Muslims to pack their things and leave Mecca for a new life. It was a dangerous undertaking, but the Muslims were willing to take their chances. Muhammad and his closest disciples stayed behind until most of his followers had left Mecca. Quraysh leaders soon realized that once Muhammad left, he would be beyond their control and would become a leader of their rivals and possible enemies. The choice was made. Muhammad must die before he reached the new land. So that no one clan would have to bear responsibility, it was decided that one member of each would plunge a sword into Muhammad at the same time. The men frantically searched Mecca, but Muhammad had been warned of the threat and had made his escape. The following morning, horsemen pursued Muhammad and at last followed his trail to the entrance of a cave. Muhammad and a disciple were hiding inside. But Muslim tradition says the Quraysh assassins found a pigeon nesting at the cave's mouth and the entrance covered with a spider web. The Quraysh concluded no one could be inside. Allah had protected his prophet. The flight from Mecca in 622 is known to Muslims as the Hijra. No event has greater importance in the culture of Islam. It became the start of the Muslim calendar. It was because it was the start of the establishment of the Muslim community. So that unlike the Gregorian calendar that starts with the birth date of Christ, um, the Muslim calendar or the Islamic calendar, which is based on the lunar calendar, um, is one that is based on this concept of community. When Muhammad arrived in Yathrib, people rushed to meet him and all wanted the honor of having him stay in their house. Instead, Muhammad allowed his favorite camel, Kazwa, to wander unguided through the town. When at last Kazwa stopped and fell to her knees, Muhammad declared that was the spot where he would live. He ordered work to begin on a house and the first mosque. Henceforth, Yathrib would be called Medina, a name simply meaning the city. But the greatest change would be in the very nature of the community itself. Muhammad's visions brought new words to unite both his own followers from Mecca and the people of Medina. The Quran now had a new verse. Those who believed and made the Hijra, and those who gave their homes and helped, these are the protectors of one another. What he began to create in Medina was something that was absolutely unheard of and novel in uh, Arabia. It was a community bound together by an ideal, by a shared ideology, by a shared religion, not by blood. He was creating, as it were, a super tribe uh, where people were not related to one another, but they were related to one, one another in faith and by agreement. If you think about 7th century Arabia being based on tribal kinship, the idea of a community based on a faith that anyone could join, slave, woman, man, rich, poor, dark, light, um, was revolutionary and, of course, very menacing for some. To further unite the Muslim peoples, Muhammad ended his mourning for Khadija and began to take new wives. In all, he would marry 11 women from many different tribes and clans. 
About seven months after the Muslims arrived in Medina, the first mosque was completed. It contained a large courtyard for saying prayers. Several methods were considered for calling Muslims to prayer. A ram's horn, like the Jews, a bell, like the Christians. Finally, it was decided that only a human voice was needed to proclaim the call to prayer that Muhammad taught his people. A young man was selected to make the call, and for the first time, Muslims heard the words that still echo from mosques around the world, beckoning all to come to God. Allah Akbar, Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the apostle of God. Come to prayer. Come to prayer. Muhammad had believed he was calling the faithful back to a religion Arabs shared with Judaism and Christianity. But following Allah's orders, the Prophet now set out to create a new identity for the Islamic community that would separate it from the older forms of monotheism. The Quran also and the Prophet believed that the revelation that had been given to Moses in what is called the Torah and, and, and the revelation to Jesus had become distorted historically, not by the prophets, but by their later communities. To dramatize the shift away from Christianity and Judaism, another order became part of the Quran. Muslims were no longer to face Jerusalem when they prayed. Forever after, God's faithful would pray facing Mecca and the Kaaba. Muhammad now had the responsibility of dealing with the mundane but important tasks of government. These roles would set him apart from the ministry of Islam's earlier prophet, Jesus Christ. There is an immense contrast between Jesus and Muhammad, uh, largely stemming in for, from the fact that uh, unlike uh, Muhammad, Jesus was never head of state. Muhammad was now a political leader. That meant he was making decisions affecting the workforce, the economy, trade, and the safety and security of Medina. To protect the struggling young community, Muhammad knew the basic politics of Arabia would need to change, and that meant the threat of the Quraysh would have to be met. Increasingly, Muhammad would turn to a solution the world has come to fear and all too often associate with Islam. He would turn to armed conflict. Since the days in Mecca, God's revelations had called for Muslims to prepare themselves to struggle to build a moral and righteous life. The Arabic word for this moral struggle is jihad. Jihad would soon be needed if the Muslim community was to survive. For when the Prophet and his followers had left Mecca, it was clear to all that a day would come when they would have to defend their beliefs in battle. Now that day was fast approaching. Out of respect for the beliefs and practices of Muslims, no image of the Prophet Muhammad or his immediate family will be shown in this biography. Although the religious foundation of Islam included Jesus' message of peace, it had also taken on the Jewish tradition of justice. The Quran's verses that flowed from Muhammad's mouth were now beginning to include a message justifying armed defense of the community. Permission is given to fight because they are wrong. Verily, Allah is most powerful for their aid. They are those who have been expelled from their homes. Muhammad's plans for the defense of the community now began to include the word jihad. It is a term that is often cited by those who oppose Islam as evidence of the religion's reliance on violence and war. But the true meaning of jihad is something quite different. Jihad comes from the Arabic root jihada, which means struggle. It is consistently referred to as a struggle for the sake of God. If the jihad is financial, you respond financially. If the jihad is violent, you respond violently. And these become uh, ways, again, of reestablishing peace. But in history, uh, that notion of jihad then comes to be appropriated and hijacked at a very early period by extremists, and that then connects to what extremists like Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda do much later on, uh, taking this concept of, of jihad 
to, to legitimate uh, what they choose to do. Muhammad had spoken about jihad while the Muslims still lived in Mecca. But the new revelations now stressed a different side of jihad. They came at a time when Muslims in Medina were fighting for survival, for most had not been permitted by the Quraysh to leave Mecca with any valuables. When Muhammad and his followers arrived in Medina, of course they were then, in a sense, exiles from their hometown. Uh, they were, to put it bluntly, unemployed. Uh, they didn't have any obvious source of support. They weren't date farmers, and all the available land in this agricultural settlement was already spoken for, so they began to make uh, raids. God had given Muslims the order to struggle. Now God's revelations allowed that struggle to include the right to survive. And so you, you also see the way in which jihad then comes to be defined as the right, and indeed at times the obligation of Muslims both as individuals and of the Muslim community itself to uh, defend itself, uh, to engage in uh, defensive warfare. Armed with the Quran's approval of defending their community, Muhammad chose a traditional Arab solution, defend yourself by attacking. Muhammad would lead an army to raid the most important Quraysh caravan of the year. Muhammad's plan was to intercept the caravan as it approached the wells of Badr near the Red Sea. But before his forces got to the wells, word of the Muslim army reached Mecca. Quraysh leaders were outraged that Muhammad would attempt to capture their caravan. A thousand men marched out of Mecca to meet the Muslim army. Muhammad now knew the Quraysh would force him to fight. The night before the battle, the Prophet had no idea if his men were willing to die in what had now become war. But after listening to stirring speeches, his followers vowed to offer their lives for Islam. The Quraysh army outnumbered the Muslims by three to one. But as the battle began, Muhammad revealed he had a great sense of tactics and his warriors fought with ferocity. The Quraysh leaders had believed a show of force would be enough to defeat the Muslims. But by midday, it was the Meccan army that panicked and fled the field. The dedication and cohesiveness of the Muslim army had saved Islam. Now Islam would reveal itself to be not only worthy of victory, but capable of compassion as well. After the first victory that the Muslims achieved at the Battle of Badr, um, they, the Muslims began in the usual Arab way to kill all the survivors and Muhammad immediately had a rev revelation to say, no, this must stop, there must be no killing of, uh, of survivors. Muhammad had set his eye on a more distant goal. The Muslim warrior's enemy of today must tomorrow become his brother in faith. Say to those who are captives in your hands, if Allah findeth any good in your hearts, he will give you something better than what has been taken from you, and he will forgive you. The victory at Badr had great consequences. After the battle, converts from all over Arabia began to flock to Medina. Like the Muslims, these converts saw the victory as a sign of God's salvation and protection, similar to God's parting of the Red Sea for the Israelites. The Battle of Badr has enormous significance to the Muslim community, and I think that was the first political act that was successful, which cemented the, the, the vision or the dream that Islam could establish a community. Islam could become a civilization. For three more years, the Quraysh army would try and destroy the Muslim community. They would win some battles, but always Muhammad and his followers struggled and survived as their numbers continued to grow. As the Meccan army struggled home after a final unsuccessful battle, their leader was at last forced to admit, every man of sense now knows Muhammad has not lied. Medina and the Muslim community were finally safe from attack. The Prophet was now poised for the final step in the pursuit of his destiny. That step would be his return to the holy city of Mecca. Muhammad's life in Medina was austere but comfortable. He had few possessions but wanted for nothing. 
He lived in quarters attached to the mosque, usually spending each night in the room of another of his wives. Muhammad's wives were a diverse group. One was a Jew, another a Bedouin. One was even his cousin. Most were chosen for various political reasons, but a few, such as his third wife, Aisha, were clearly matters of the heart. Muhammad now told his followers that revelations from God said each man was permitted to take no more than four wives, and the husband was required to treat them all as equals. Marry women of your choice, two, three, or four. But if you fear that you will not be able to maintain justice between your wives, then marry only one. The modern world has frequently come to view Islam as male-oriented at best and misogynistic at worst. But in truth, Muhammad's teachings brought women new rights that would not be achieved in the Christian world for centuries. The first was the right to life. The Quran forbade the practice of female infanticide, which had been common in early Arabia. Women were also given the right to uh, an education, to be duly educated as men were, um, to inherit, which meant that they could buy and sell property, which again would mean that they would have to um, undertake business transactions. The custom of Muslim women wearing veils is mistakenly pointed to as another indication of Islam's prejudice against women. The emancipation of women was a project that was very dear to the Prophet's heart. There is nothing in the Quran about all women having to be veiled or secluded in a separate part of the house. This is a practice that the Muslims picked up three or four generations after the death of the Prophet. I feel that being a contemporary educated woman is far more in line with what the Prophet would have aspired for for a woman than what we've seen maybe throughout recent Islamic history. Muhammad had achieved enormous success. His followers had grown in less than 20 years from a handful to thousands of Dukhans. But he could not complete his mission so long as the holy site of the Kaaba remained home to idols. In January of the year 630, Muhammad set out for Mecca at the head of an army of 10,000. As the Muslims approached the holy city, Meccan people made no attempt to resist. It was clear that the old gods of the Quraysh were powerless in the face of Islam. The prophet had no desire for blood. He issued an amnesty as a symbol of his wish to unite all people as the children of one God. The only victims he sought remained sitting in the Kaaba. The prophet entered the holy structure and proceeded to lead the destruction of all 365 idols as he recited the verse, the truth has arrived and vanquished falsehood. Muhammad had validated his vision and proclaimed to the world the force and vitality of Islam. By the time of his death, June 632, the prophet had brought peace to Arabia. He had transformed a religion of many gods into a powerful monotheism based on a moral and ethical guide for daily living. But Muhammad's death was actually the birth of the great age of Islam. Within a hundred years, the words of the prophet spread from Arabia to the world. As Arab culture mixed with Greek and Byzantine learning, an era of Islamic enlightenment brought enormous advances in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, literature, and architecture. Who would have thought today, let alone then, that a man who is described as born an orphan into a divided Arabian society, illiterate, a caravan manager, would create a religious tradition that within a hundred years of his death, its physical presence would spill out of Arabia, go all the way to North Africa and all the way over to India. And he always warned his followers not to make him into a Jesus, not ever to say that he was divine. He was just an ordinary man, he said. The fact that he led what we might call a normal life, I think, makes him very appealing to many Muslims, to most Muslims, perhaps, that he married, that he had children. These are all things, I think, that make him uh, very approachable as a model for people. 
So many centuries after it ended, Muhammad's life remains the foundation of the faith he founded. Today, it is the fastest growing religion on earth. As these worshipers respond to the ancient call for prayer, each looks to the Prophet's example to provide peace and serenity in their daily lives. The ancient Kaaba remains in Mecca, and millions of pilgrims arrive each year to retrace the footsteps of the Prophet. The site of Muhammad's ascension on his winged creature to meet God is today the Mosque of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Muhammad's gateway to heaven has tragically become the focus of enmity and hatred between two peoples who trace their ancestry to the same beginnings. Some Muslims who partake of violence use the words of a compassionate man to legitimize their acts of cruelty and hatred. They cite verses of the Quran as inspiration for their monstrous ambitions. Since September the 11th, we've heard Osama bin Laden reciting some really blood-curdling verses from the Quran. But what bin Laden fails to do is to mention or recite the verses that in every case succeed these ferocious verses, which say, but forgiveness is better. If one wants to take one part of the story, uh, one of the chapters, and, and, and develop a conception of the prophet upon that single chapter, well, of course, it's going to be very distorted, and the prophet is going to be understood as a man of violence and a man of hate. When people commit violence, and injustice in the name of Islam. They are committing violence and injustice against Muhammad and God. For peace to come to a troubled world, Muslim and non-Muslim alike will have to find a source of trust and acceptance of their common goals. One such source could be a better understanding of the life of Muhammad. Cleansed of the selfish motives that some terrorists wish to give them, the words of the prophet remain to offer hope and optimism to a troubled world. Whosoever killeth a human being, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind.